and welcome to our evening service of worship of the living God here at Reynard Way, Northampton. Welcome to, if you're joining us online, you don't have to be uh, in a good place to join us. You don't even have to be in a good place to meet with God this very evening. One of the psalmists said this, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. We don't know what those depths were, but they're perhaps purposely undefined, so that we, in our depths, if any of us are in depths this evening, may know that we can come to. O Lord, he continues, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. And then this, which should greatly encourage all and any of us. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities. O oh Lord, who could stand? But, what a glorious biblical but. With you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. May we, out of whatever depths we may find ourselves in this evening, or none, come to worship the one true living God. Glory be to him who loved us, washed us from each guilty stain. Glory be to him who bought us, made us kings with him to reign. Glory, 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 glory to the lamb who once was slain. 151, if you're following in the blue hymn book, uh, let's stand and rejoice and sing to God. Come to our God in prayer together.
we wait for the Lord. Our souls wait. And in his word we hope. Our soul waits for the Lord. More than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. Oh, Israel. Oh, everybody. Hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love. And with him is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem all who believe from all their iniquities. What a faithful God have we. O oh Lord, faithful in every way, great is your faithfulness. We deserve none of this, Lord. And yet, not only from the depths have we sometimes cried to you, but you yourself sent your Son down from heaven to this broken world and he himself, God the Son, humbled himself and made himself obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Wherefore God has highly exalted him. But Lord, that death, let us ponder it for a moment in our praying before you. That death we cannot begin to imagine. But Lord, out of the depths the psalmist cried, Lord, what great depths did the Son of God cry? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Lord, we begin to know the answer to that. You forsook your dear, beloved son. For he was bearing in his own body on that cross the punishment, the wrath that we rightly deserve. O oh Lord, whatever depths we may find ourselves in this evening or at any other time, they are no deeper than your dear Son, our Saviour, has already experienced on behalf of all who put their trust in him. O oh Lord, there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. And Lord, this, this is what drives and motivates and puts voice when we can sing, Lord, into our songs, into our heart's devotion. It is this salvation. It is this Saviour. It is this dear Lord Jesus Christ that stirs us, that causes us to be here, that wants to be here. Oh, Father, so as we come, we realise we've come to worship and we would attempt and, and ask your help to do that. Lord, we'd also come to recognise our great salvation and to have our ears and our minds and hearts informed again of your word, of your love, of your discipline of your grace. We ask for your help in all these things. And especially, Lord, to any who are struggling, who are in the depths, who do need to know that you have come into those depths and deeper with us sinners. Lord, and we ask all these things in the name of the same Lord Jesus Christ, coming King, Amen. And our next hymn, our second hymn, 
speaks about that Calvary, that Golgotha experience of our Lord. Oh, to see the dawn. Thank you, singers. Thank you, Andy. Of the darkest day, Christ on the road to Calvary, tried by sinful men, torn and beaten, then nailed to a cross of wood. Let's stand and sing. Indeed, so that amen, yes. Two readings this evening. Our first is from John chapter five, 6, John's Gospel chapter 6. The Lord Jesus has just fed the 5,000, probably an incident known to most of us. And uh, this takes up the narrative 
uh, as John writes, in the, in, inspired by the Holy Spirit to pen the words of his gospel. John chapter 6 and verse 15. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not labour for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread Always, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Amen. This is God's word. my privilege uh, to welcome you this evening, whether you're here in the building. It's good to see uh, several here, and it's uh, good to see you, or for you to see us anyway, online, if you're joining us uh, online this evening. Welcome to Reynard Way Church in Northampton. Uh, just make clear that um, our hymn chooser tonight as our pastor, all but the last one, the, all the three, tune, three hymns we're going to the third one to be had yet, Paul, our pastor, chose, and we're thankful to God for his involvement behind the scenes uh, so often uh, in the last years, in fact. And the, our preacher tonight is Christy Wells, whom you'll see in a moment, um, 
and we're continuing in our look at Jonah, Jonah chapter 2 this evening, which Chris is going to read in a few moments. Um, There is a third wedding that happens before the two we mentioned this morning. And that third one is uh, Mim uh, Keeley and Carl to be married on the 11th of June, just a week on Friday. So uh, pray for the happy couple. Two happy couples. Uh, just to uh, let you know, although these are all in the, uh, the new June calendar that is available online, if you don't normally receive um, the bulletins and information I send out, which I always address to friends and attenders at Reynard Way, uh, and would like to receive those, uh, then please have a word and you'll, they will be put on that list. Uh, and if you are on that list, you will receive the June calendar already. If you haven't got a computer, there are paper copies uh, out in the vestibule there for you to take if you'd like to see what's happening in June. And this being the first week of June, very soon, uh, we're meeting on Wednesday for a central praise and prayer meeting, which is on Zoom. And again, if you're on that, on that same list, you'll have the link, the Zoom link, uh, early this week. And again, if you want to join that and haven't, not on that list, then uh, ask me later. Let's hop our seven, Zoom, uh, on Wednesday evening for praise and prayer. We are open to receive um, masses for praise and um, requests for prayer uh, to that meeting. So do have a word with Andy Wellsford, who's somewhere about. Here he is, uh, if you have any matters in that category. Uh, Bikes and barbecue take place for young people from three till six on Thursday this week. You need to book young people. Uh, If you're at home, you need to book with Karen uh, somehow before Wednesday, I'm going to guess. Yes, by by Wednesday, please. That's uh, three o'clock to six o'clock. You'll need to have details of that as well from Karen if you haven't got them already. We mentioned prayer times, we, that's tomorrow and uh, Saturday. On Saturday as well, following the prayer time at eight till nine, a men's breakfast being the first Saturday of the month. It's a reduced breakfast in these restricted times, but you still need please to book men if you're coming to that breakfast with Mark or Margaret. That's 9.15 till 10.30 uh, on Saturday. Have I got forgotten anything? Speak now. Okay, let's come to God in prayer again. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that salvation belongs to the Lord. And each of us, Lord, who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ can testify that we have done nothing towards our own salvation. The, the, the freedom that you have given us by putting our sins upon him, the Lord Jesus Christ, is all an act of your grace and the work applying it of your Holy Spirit. And we rejoice in this great salvation this evening. And we look uh, from Jonah 2 to be hearing more about it shortly. Lord, and if we are strangers to this great liberating truth, this setting free saviour, then Lord we pray that this evening you may enlighten us, you may bring us light into our ignorance, you may 
even now be sweeping away those what we might call prejudices or uh, defeater beliefs, I think, somebody recently called them, that prevent you entering, coming in, because we put up barriers against you. Oh, Lord, we pray, break down those barriers. Lord, and if, as believers, as we remind you this morning, uh, we, we look back, as Lot's wife did, Oh, Lord, might you come to us this evening and show us that looking back is not something that will be wise to do under any circumstances. So, Lord, if we are struggling as believers this evening, we pray, oh God, that you will have dealings with us. Lord, that you will show us uh, that our present course of rebellion, perhaps, of complaining, of lack of love, is an unwise course. And although we feel perhaps helpless to change it, Lord, you have that strength. And Lord, as your servant said, when I am weak, then am I strong. Because the Apostle Paul realised that his strength, even in his weakness, perhaps especially in his weakness, was all in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, you know whatever depths we're in, whatever heights of rejoicing we are in this evening. And we ask for you to come and do business with our souls. Lord, we would pray for your servant, Christy. He's not stood in this pulpit before. Uh, and we, we hardly know him. But Lord, we have had reports of him and we felt it right to ask him to preach. And so we commend your young servant to you that he may faithfully unfold, uh, open up, expound your word from Jonah 2 to us this evening and that we may benefit, be challenged, be rebuked, and that he too may be warmed in his soul as he speaks your word. We would be mindful, Lord, of other churches and fellowships in our county, in our town, and beyond. Lord, that you would watch over them, keep them faithful to your word. Some will be struggling. Lord, some diminishing. Oh, Lord, we do not apologise for asking for your mercy to be sent to this poor land in reviving power. Lord, you have held up your hand. You have allowed your gospel to be preached still. And yet, as a nation, we have not listened. Oh, Lord, in these dark times of restrictions physically and of challenges to mental health, and of loneliness and depression and abuse in families and to miscarriages of justice. Oh, Lord, look, we pray with mercy upon us. 
and bring in, as Andy so eloquently prayed this morning, bring in the light of the gospel of our dear Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Lord, without him, we are totally lost. So we commend to you our, our preachers and particularly our preacher this evening. We ask for your help uh, to him and to us as we hear. And we ask it in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Chris is now going to come and read from Jonah chapter 2. So be turning to that, please, as he comes up. You'll have to excuse my slight cold. It's been <laughs> unfortunate timing. Um, but let, let's read from Jonah chapter 2. I'm going to start at chapter 1, verse 17, and run through to the end of the chapter. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me, and your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life, the deep surrounded me, weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord, my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. I wonder where you would place yourself this evening in Jonah's journey. Whether you'd be dashing about on the decks of the ship, um, perhaps with the sailors there, whether you'd be in the belly of the ship, fast asleep with Jonah, whether you're thrashing about in the waves, perhaps under great affliction, perhaps you've given up hope, you've sunk down beneath the waves, or perhaps you're happily in the belly of the great fish at the bottom. Well, I trust that wherever you would be spiritually this evening, the Lord has a word for you, and indeed his word is truth. And so let me just pray briefly now before I start that the Lord would indeed speak to us through his word. So let's, let's pray. O oh Lord God, our heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for your word. Your word is truth, and we ask, Lord, that you would sanctify us in your word, that you would speak through your word to us, and wherever we might be this evening, spiritually and physically, that you would indeed change us and conform us to the Lord Jesus. We ask, Lord, that by your words you would testify to your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. So to start with, we're going to go on a bit of a journey so to speak, back right to the beginning of mankind. And I hope that as we then traverse history in a very brief sense, we're going to pick up some of, some of the themes that we're then going to see Jonah praying about in his prayer, and that will hopefully bring a bit more depth and more context to what we read. So imagine that you're back in the Garden of Eden. We often forget that the Garden of Eden was high up. It was on a mountain. It was a beautiful garden. It was, if you like, a type of temple that 
Adam was there tending with his wife Eve. But of course, we know that the journey of mankind was down. Mankind started off high up on the mountain. Very shortly, we know what happened. Adam and Eve ate of the fruit. The serpent deceived them, and down they came. They were driven out. Let me read these words to you from Genesis. This is Genesis 2, 16 and 17. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the, knowledge of, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. From the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. You see, the Lord placed mankind in Adam in the garden. There was a period which was, if you like, a probation. Adam was said, do this and you'll live. Do that and you'll die. And of course, Adam did what he was commanded not to do. He came under the curse of God and us in him. And so he was driven out. Think, for instance, Genesis chapter 3. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. We've heard that, haven't we, in Jonah, the presence of the Lord. Was that not what Jonah was fleeing from? Genesis 3.24 reads, He drove out the man. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. You see, not only did man himself flee from the Lord, but God drove him out. This God who is holy and upright, just, perfect, man who had sadly become anything but that. But right at the bottom of mankind's spiritual plight, we read the Lord's actual curse on the woman and on the serpent. But listen to what he says. I will put enmity between you and the woman, that's the serpent and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. We thought that mankind was surely going to die if they disobeyed God. And indeed they did in a spiritual sense and in a physical sense they're cast out. But God says your offspring to the woman. So there's going to be a continuation of mankind. This downward journey is going to continue at least for some time. But there's a promise there, isn't there, of one who would crush the serpent's head, one who would reverse the curse and bring spiritual and physical life back from spiritual and physical death. It's a wonderful picture, isn't it? Mankind tumbling downhill spiritually at a great rate and God at the very bottom delivering a promise of future salvation. There's a, a particularly vivid image in Genesis of God's wrath, his right anger and indignation against sin that we were hearing from this morning about the flood that wiped out mankind with the exception of Noah. And God says in Genesis chapter 6, and think of this as a statement to all mankind, including us sat here this evening. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I've created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things that the birds of the heavens, for I'm sorry that I've made them. That is a great indictment against all mankind and against us here this evening. And fortunately, it is not the end. We might consider that special particular people that God called out of this nosedive of the human race. He called Abram, later Abraham, and he made promises to him. He promised that in him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. He said, in effect, that it is through you, Abraham, that these promises that I gave in the garden to redeem mankind are going to come. It's from your offspring 
that salvation will come. And from Abraham came this great nation, Israel. I wonder how Israel fared. How do we think? Were they anything different from the rest of mankind? Well, certainly they had God's promises, but we know how it ended up. In 2 Kings chapter 17, the Lord says, Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. None was left but the tribe of Judah only. Judah also did not keep the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the customs that Israel had introduced. And the Lord rejected all the descendants of Israel and afflicted them and gave them into the hand of plunderers until he had cast them out of his sight. You see, man needed something more. Promises were not enough in themselves. It was the fulfilment of the promises that man looked to. And this is exactly where we find ourselves this evening. Jonah's first readers were Israelites cast into exile under the Assyrians. They were without hope in the world. They had the promises, but where was the fulfilment? Had God been unfaithful to them? Well, we shall hopefully see this evening that Jonah is a vivid picture of Israel and of all mankind in them, that indeed God always keeps his promises. So let's switch now to considering Jonah's journey. So if you'll turn with me back again to chapter 2. We'll remember from previous weeks that Jonah's journey is very much the same as mankind's journey. It's down, 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 down. Chapter 1, verse 3 reads, But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. We've heard that, haven't we, in Genesis. And he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. He went down to Joppa. Verse 5, The mariners were afraid and each cried out to his God and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and he was fast asleep. You see, Jonah, this evening as we come to chapter 2, goes down even further. From the relative height of the surface of the sea, he is now plunged down into the waves. He's not just sat about on the top, he is sunk right down. Jonah flees from the presence of the Lord, as mankind did from the Garden of Eden. He's driven from God's presence as mankind was from the garden, as Israel was. If we turn now to to verse 2. I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. This verse helps us to understand a bit more of what the symbolism of being cast down means. You see, verse 2 is in a sense parallel. Um, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, starts the verse. At, At the end, I cried out. You see, two halves of the verse are saying the same thing in essence. Jonah is likening his distress to the belly of Sheol. I cried out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. The two are synonymous. Jonah is saying to the reader, to us this evening, that his distress is like being in the realm of the dead. Chapter 2, verse 6, repeats the theme. Jonah is a picture of ultimate judgment. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. That is the realm of the dead again. Jonah leaves us in no doubt that where he is, spiritually, so to speak, is death. He's dead and gone. There's no life, no spiritual life left in him. His heart is torn apart. And of course, overarching this chapter, we have that image of water, the watery judgment of Genesis chapter 6.
this next point is striking. Verse 3 reads, For you cast me into the deep, into the hearts of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Not only is Jonah cursed, but he knows who he's cursed by. He knows that it's God who's cast him down. It's God whose judgment has come upon him. God whose sight he's been pushed out of. You see, it's not an impersonal, far-off judgment. It's a judgment that's very personal, and it's here with him. It cuts to his very heart. Although he's fleeing God's presence, it's as if God is present there, but in judgment. You can imagine Jonah, can't you, sinking to the very bottom, accursed, as good as dead. You imagine him crying out in verse 2, my God, my God, as he's dragged down. But this leads us, you may have noticed that we danced around slightly in the chapter to, to verse 4. And that's because the author has, has left us a wonderful clue in the chapter in terms of its structure. Between verses 1 and 6, it's, if you like, an arrow. Imagine you're writing an email. Each line you type, press enter onto the next line, press tab, shifts across. Next one, typing tab, shifts across. So you get this stepping down. Eventually we reach verse 4, and at that point, when we press enter, is a backspace, and we start coming back the other way. So the words are a big arrow, like this. And verse 4 is right at the very centre of it. You'll notice that most of this poetic prayer is written in the past tense. I called out to the Lord, I went down... But when we come to verse 4, it's, Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look to your holy temple. The author is emphasising something clearly here. This is where he wants us to look. This is where the verses are heading. Why would Jonah want to emphasise verse 4? To a people who are cast out of the Lord's presence in exile. To us who we may feel this evening as if we're away from the Lord's presence. So let's spend some time thinking about verse 4. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. I wonder how you think of the presence of the Lord, the sight of the Lord, all of these things that are symbolic and poetic and often difficult to put our finger on. The sight of the Lord, to be before the Lord's face consciously in the Old Testament is the epitome of blessing. To live consciously before the Lord is to be supremely blessed. In Numbers chapter 6, we have that great blessing of Aaron to the Israelites, where he in effect says that blessing is to be before God's face, perhaps Afterwards, it would be a a good thing to to look up that reference and just run through it yourself and and see that each line reflects on the previous one, fleshing out this idea of blessing to be before God's face. But what about the presence of the Lord? Verse 4 reads, I'm driven away from your sight. But surely God is everywhere. God's presence is everywhere. A.W. Tozer has a a good analogy for for God's presence in that he fills the entire universe and indeed is beyond it. He says it's as if the universe were a bucket submerged in the sea. So God fills it and is so far beyond it. But we often feel so far from God, especially in, in difficult times when we think, surely the Lord must be with us. We feel so far apart. And Toza goes on to say that the difference why God can be everywhere in everything and yet feel so far away is because spiritually we couldn't be more different. We remember in the garden in Genesis how as sin came in, there was that great difference, that great distinction which was not there before, which was sin. 
how a holy God cannot be in communion with an unholy, unrighteous people such as us. See, God's relationships are always on his terms. We must be holy before we can approach God. We'll think about that a bit more later. You see, God dictates the terms of the relationship. In the Old Testament, it was the temple. Perhaps that helps us to understand the second half. Yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. Jonah is saying this place where God has promised to meet with his people, where he's taken the initiative and come down and said, I will dwell with my people here and even I will forgive you your sins in an earthly and typical way for the Israelites. This was where Jonah was looking. He said, God, if you've promised that you will meet me here, that is where I want to look. I wonder where you would look this evening to meet with God. Where might we look? With, with no temple, so to speak. With no earthly visible sign. But don't we see, brothers and sisters, that we here, through the Lord Jesus Christ, are the earthly visible sign of the Lord dwelling amongst his people. He's here with us now. God's relationships are always established on his terms. To get into the mind of Jonah when it comes to looking to the temple and how that relates to his hope, we thought a bit in our prayers about Psalm 130. And let me just turn there now and, and read it to you because I think it's, it gives such wonderful expression to what Jonah is, is trying to set before the Israelites in exile. So this is Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark my iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchman for the morning. More than watchman for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Jonah understood the temple. He understood that it was earthly and typical of a greater reality that was to be fulfilled that Israel were to look to the temple as a picture of what God would one day do in forgiving the sins of his people in an absolute final way. There's only one way that that can happen, and that is in the satisfaction of God's justice. Does not the Lord Jesus himself come and suffer our punishment, satisfying the justice of God, taking upon himself all of our sin, our unbelief, our rebellion, our fleeing from the presence of God? At the bottom, Jonah is scooped up by the fish. Chapter 1, verse 17 says... The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Jonah's confidence was in the Lord, and the Lord delivered. The Lord delivered him. The picture of Jonah sinking down, being swallowed up, being thrown up, is a picture of deliverance. I want us to think briefly now about who the Lord is that Jonah was hoping in. Who was the Lord? You'll see it there in, in capital letters in your Bible. It's funny that that should be written in that way, but we know that that's the covenant name of God. It's Yahweh, God as he revealed himself to Jonah's forefathers, God of the covenant. We also learn 
in chapter 1, verse 9, that he is the God of all creation. Jonah confesses it. I'm a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. He is the God who made all things. He is sovereign. Verse 8 reads, hope of steadfast love. These people who forsake, uh, these people who regard idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. Steadfast love is in God because God is the God who comes down and loves and meets with his people, of which the temple was a picture. So Jonah's confidence is in the God of Israel. Who is he? Who is this God? It often doesn't seem like the Lord, the covenant God of Israel, has come down to us. But indeed he has. Do you remember our reading from John chapter 6? You see, the Lord Jesus Christ identifies himself intimately as one with the covenant God of Israel. He has the prerogative to forgive. He was the one who took the judgment onto himself and offers mercy to everyone here this evening. By turning away from our sin, our fleeing from God as Jonah did, and turning to him, hoping in him, and crying out to him, we can receive mercy. Listen to those words of John again. The sea became rough, much like it would have been for Jonah, because a strong wind was blowing. When they rode about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. The Lord Jesus says, ego imi, I am the covenant name of God. I am who I am. Jesus identifies himself as God. Come to the Lord Jesus this evening. Come to God and he offers forgiveness. Confess with Jonah that he fled the Lord's presence. Confess with him that we are under God's judgment rightly, that these billows, these waves, the spiritual judgment that is upon us is indeed none other but God's. The Lord Jesus, so to speak, jumped in to the waters that Jonah was in. The waves swept over him and dragged him down. Our sin tied around him like a great lead weight, dragged him below the waves. As Jonah would have cried out, perhaps, my God, my God, hear the Lord Jesus this evening. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When it comes to applying these words to us this evening, the Lord has been very kind in that Jonah does it for us in verses 8 and 9. He says, those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. These two verses, 8 and 9, trapped together as they are, lead us to a conclusion that's perhaps uncomfortable. Jonah says, those who pay regard to vain idols, almost as if it were another group of people, another group of people. Surely Jonah, as an Israelite, would not have idols. How could he? Surely not. But I think the teaching of the text this evening indicates that Jonah himself did have idols that he needed to forsake. We can have idols. We can not look outward to God, but instead look inward for our assurance. When we feel devoid of the presence of God, where, where do we look? Do we look inside and say, if only my faith were greater, surely I would know more of God's presence? 
Is that where we look? Do we look into ourselves? We can very easily make an idol out of our faith. We can stare at the hand that grasps the Lord Jesus and not at him. Is it faith in faith that saves or is it faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Look beyond yourself this evening to the Lord Jesus, to the fulfilment of God's promises. As we come to a close, I just want to revisit mankind's journey that we talked about briefly at the start. Our chapter this evening is bookended by chapter 1, verse 17, Jonah being swallowed up by the fish. And chapter 2, verse 10, the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. The author is clearly suggesting something to those Israelite readers. He's suggesting that there's deliverance, but it takes the form of resurrection, being given life from the dead. We've seen how Jonah saw himself as effectively dead, and now he's brought to life. So we have bookends showing us resurrection. It is, if you like, a resurrection sandwich. And the filling is Jonah in his judgment. Jonah is given life from the dead. He is raised up. He's vomited up as if death couldn't hold him. Reminds us of our Lord Jesus, doesn't it? Righteous he was, having suffered the punishment for our sins. Death had no longer a claim on him. But it's not only the curse of death from the Garden of Eden that's reversed. You see, there's also a playing out of God's promises being fulfilled here. Because Jonah is given life from the dead. The curse is reversed. But notice what happens next in chapter 3, verse 5. Having preached to the Ninevites, the people of Nineveh believed God. The people of Nineveh were not Israelites. They were Israel's sworn enemies. They were, if you like, a picture of the nations. The nations, through Abraham, would be blessed. Jonah is given new life. The curse is reversed. And now he goes and brings blessing to the nations. God is faithful. He keeps his promises. This is a beautiful picture is it not, of what the Lord Jesus accomplished, having suffered death and risen again from the dead, the gospel went out to the nations and brought supreme blessing. To be before the face of God consciously, to come in the Lord Jesus Christ and through him to God our Father. You see, the true worshipper worships in spirit and in truth. God establishes his relationship by his truth and by sending his spirit to apply that truth, the knowledge of the truth, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ to my heart, to your heart, to whoever will believe. And so in the spirit, we come into the presence of God and we have confidence because of God's words that indeed we are in his presence. So as I finish Humour me. Um, imagine you have met Jonah on the beach. You are stood there on the sand, this dripping wet man with a slightly wild look in his eyes comes towards you and he says, you'll never guess what happened to me. I died. I went down to the very depths of the sea. Yet I was brought up from the depths. It was cold and dark and wet and it was quiet it was as if nothing was there as if the world was gone there was just void but then there was light God spoke to the fish and there was light Jonah is a new creation he has been made again you too can be made again this evening 
by the true fulfillment of these words that we have. The Lord Jesus stands willing and able to make you new, to reverse the curse, to give you life, to bring blessing, that you might know the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, that you might look full into God's face and be satisfied. I pray that we might all know that blessing this evening. Let me pray for us as we finish. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you make promises and you keep your promises. We thank you, Lord, that you sent your Son to suffer and to die in our place. Yeah, we thank you, Lord, that death could not hold you, that having suffered once for our sins, you rose again to everlasting life. And we thank you, O oh Lord, that in taking humanity, our human nature, into union with yourself, so by faith in you we are raised into the very throne room of heaven, that we might be with you, that we might know your presence, that we might love your presence, that we might enjoy you for all eternity. We thank you, Lord, that you are there, risen, reigning now in heaven, and we worship you. We worship you that your word is truth, that you fulfill your promises, that your word to Jonah testifies to you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you that you are here with us now by your spirit, and we ask, Heavenly Father, that you would bless your words to us. Lord, for any who have heard this evening that do not know you, Father, have mercy, we ask. Please, may they come to know you, O Lord. Heavenly Father, hear us, we pray, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I think we've got one more hymn. We have got one more hymn. Great is thy faithfulness.
pray together. Our Father God, we thank you for the honesty of your word. Lord, we thank you that you paint us as we really are. Lord, that we have, by nature, fled from your presence. And Lord, that has only ever and entirely taken us down, down, down to the depths. Lord, we know that is true in our heart of hearts. No matter how we try and paint the picture of our lives, no matter how we try and cover for the reality, Lord, we know that being far from you is exactly as has been pictured to us this evening. Lord, it is the depths. It's heading to Sheol. It's heading to the land of the dead. And Lord, we thank you that we have a saviour who went even deeper. Lord, that he went to the very depths of hell itself on that cross to save us and to pluck us up from the depths that we had sunk to. And Lord, to think that we should be lifted up to heaven to come into the very presence of God because of our Saviour and because of all that he has done for us. Lord, we thank you for how you have shown us these truths this evening through your servant Christy. Lord, we pray that you would write these things upon our hearts and, Lord, it would put a glad song in our mouths to have such a Saviour who has sunk so low to lift us so high because of the breadth and the depth and the height of his love for us unworthy sinners and now may the lord bless you and keep you the lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you the lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace amen <laughs>